Let's get started, guys. Um, so, welcome to the Cloud Native panel. Um, so, Cloud Native, it means uh, a lot more than just spinning up an EC2 instance in AWS and deploying your Drupal. Um, Cloud Native really is like a holistic approach to uh, building and running applications in a way that really uh, takes full advantage of the cloud computing model. Uh, so, everything from design, implementation, deployment, and operations. So, uh, today we're going to be discussing technologies like uh, containers, cloud providers like Amazon, Google Cloud, DigitalOcean, those types of things, uh, and we're going to get stuck into some Kubernetes as well. Uh, so we have three very talented panelists today. Uh, we have, uh, I'm starting from the left, uh, Mike Richardson from Ironstar. <laughs> uh, Nick Shu from Skipper. And and Scott Leggett from Amazy. Uh, could you guys just introduce yourselves, give like a 30 second intro on you know, who you are and what you're doing with containers, the cloud, Kubernetes? Sure, thanks Nick. Um, so yeah, I'm Scott. Um, I'm fairly new to the uh, Drupal world. Uh, I've been at Amazy for um, just uh, nearly three months now. Uh, but I've been doing uh, containers, fiddling with Docker and stuff for maybe three or four years, and um, Kubernetes for the last couple of years of that. So um, yeah, I've worked on a few different uh, cloud platforms. Um, yeah, that's about me. Sweet. Uh, my name's Nick Shu. Oh, you introduced me anyway. <laughs> but um, yeah, I uh, work on the Skipper platform, uh, command line based. Uh, hosting platform built on top of Kubernetes. I've been on a container Kubernetes journey for the past couple of years, um, since I think it was like Kubernetes 1.1 and onwards. Um, yeah, it's definitely been a journey and I'm looking forward to answering the questions. <laughs> cool, thank you. Uh, so I'm Mike Richardson, I'm the managing director of co-founder of Einstar, yet another Drupal hosting provider. Uh, we run production Kubernetes environments using our Takedo platform which if you haven't checked it out, highly recommended, the Takedo local development environment, which I plug at every opportunity I have. Uh, as I said, we run Kubernetes in production, uh, and uh, I think like everybody here, we've gone through that process of very early adoption up to more and more automation and more and more scalability uh, on, for us on AWS and Google Cloud. Awesome. Uh, all right, so just so that we can get a feeling for the room, just want to gauge uh, like, you know, what level of familiarity you guys have. Um, so could I just get a show of hands if you're getting started in this space, like you haven't really had a chance to play with containers, the cloud, Kubernetes? Okay. Yeah, got a couple of hands, cool. Um, who here is using containers for like a local dev stack or maybe, you know, the CI, things like that? Awesome. Um, is anyone running Kubernetes? Running Kubernetes in production? Um, cool. <laughs> And what about, is like anyone constrained to like on-premise hosting? Just a couple of sheepish hands up the back. You, I feel sorry for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, cool, all right, so just gonna be keeping an eye on the, the, this hashtag. So if you've got questions, feel free to tweet at that. Um, I will also go around at the end with the mic, so hopefully we get time to do that. Okay, so let's get stuck into the questions. Um, so for the panelists, can, for people still running legacy style hosting on like virtual machines or bare metal, can you explain like one of the reasons why they should be looking into containerizing their Drupal apps? Who's gonna go first? Uh, so for, for us, I think the, the biggest advantage that we've seen with it is repeatability and consistency. When you move from a VM-based architecture to a container-based architecture, it's very easy to look at a container definition and say, right, this is what my container does. And every time you run that container, you're going to get a very consistent result. Um, and it is a lot easier, I think, now to create a container-based infrastructure than it is to create a VM-based infrastructure uh, with all of the really good examples that are out there about how to run uh, specifically Drupal in Docker on the different uh, Kubernetes and cloud providers. Um, so for us, it was there was a few things, but the main one that I always like to land on is PHP upgrades. 
sounds a bit boring, but um, the you get kind of this ability to migrate a single app, uh, you know, from PHP 5.6 to 7, and um, whereas on like a traditional VM stack, you're stuck with like upgrading the host, which then probably upgrades like, you know, 10, 15 other sites if you're doing a shared instance on that one. And then it also comes down to like deployment, like you have to then, ops and devs have to go, well, okay, so you're gonna update PHP and then I'll run the deploy and like it's this really like, um, hard sort of lockstep kind of situation to do those upgrades. So for me, like that was a massive, massive win that projects could declare when they wanted to upgrade their PHP versions, but also it was seamless and we didn't have to be super involved in that process. And just as easy to downgrade as well. And just as easy to downgrade, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that was gonna be, uh, yeah, my point as well, the flip side of the upgrading is that if something goes wrong, um, you know, you've got these images which are your sort of immutable build artifacts that make up your application. You've uh, rolled, you know, rolled out the new ones in production, something's gone wrong, you just wanna roll back and try and fix whatever's broken. Um, it's easy because you've just, you've still got that other stuff still there. It, you know, those um, artifacts can just be picked up and just put back into production and um, yeah, life goes on. It's not, um, you're not trying to sort of mutate state, I guess. Yeah, awesome, thanks guys. Uh, like, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've faced when running Drupal in containers? Yeah, let's, yeah. File systems. Yeah, <laughs> stateful file systems. <laughs> yeah, cool, we'll get stuck into that later on. Um, it, what advice do you have in, uh, for security patching and general maintenance of base images and, and your app images? I can go first, yeah. Um, I think um, general advice would be Try not to do too much wild customization. Try and stick as close as possible to um, your upstream, um, just because it just means that there's less stuff for you to maintain. Yeah, I've been thinking about it quite a bit lately, where a lot of people talk about like have really small images, like so then you have less attack surface. But I don't think it's. I think it's being looked at the wrong way. It's not about having really small images, it's like you said, it's like having less stuff thrown in there. It's like what's, you know, it's, it's really understanding what, what you're deploying um, and also sticking to a schedule or a routine to make sure they're up to date. Yeah, I think that, that last bit is really important. Uh, making sure that you don't let your containers go stale by only updating them every three months or only updating every six months or when you need to. Uh, we, we put all of our containers through a build system where every month they're going to get automatically rebuilt with whatever the latest version is, versions that we haven't specifically pinned of things like PHP and Nginx and so on. Um, and that goes into a non-production pipeline for a month before it goes into a production pipeline. So we've, we've constantly got those images being refreshed. Um, that of course means you're gonna get patched for any security things that come out, but you will also be going headfirst into any bugs that get introduced. Um, so you've got to manage that trade-off. The other thing, uh, if you were in Toby Bellwood's talk earlier, uh, key.io and a few other uh, hosted images, image providers have some turnkey solutions that will scan your Docker images for any known published vulnerabilities and give you instructions on how you can go about um, mitigating those. Yeah, that's a great point. So I guess there's a, an issue there where if you're um, not deploying regularly, that even if your base images are receiving security updates, that your application is still potentially vulnerable. So building that automation is important. Cool. Um, is achieving local dev prod parity a realistic goal with uh, containers? Absolutely. If you've, if you've got containers, you can have the same container running anywhere and it's going to be, uh, I think, especially if you're on something like Kubernetes where it's very easy to run a, a, you know, a multi-tier application or multiple layers of redundancy without necessarily having to have a duplication of cost, then it's very easy to say, I want, I want staging to be exactly like prod, and you're gonna have, I mentioned before, that consistency of this is what staging looks like, and if I deploy this container to prod, I can have a high degree of confidence that prod's gonna behave exactly the same way. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think we sometimes overdo it trying to, um, keep the parity between our production hosting and our local development. 
Um, I think we get a lot of that by running, like just by running the same containers, you're mostly there. Um, you're very close to there. And I think from there, like you can make trade-offs on both sides. There's this whole idea of like the inner loop and then the outer loop. And the inner loop being like your local development and CI, and that's very specific to different teams and how they operate, whereas in production, you have this outer loop and this workflow from going from dev to staging to production. So, um, so I guess my advice around it is not not to be too um, prescriptive, but and um, think about the best workflow for you guys. Yeah. I don't have much more to add. Yeah. Cool. It's good. All right, um, so the most common path to the cloud for you know, people getting into it is basically just to spin up an instance, deploy a LAMP stack, and run your Drupal code, Bob's your uncle. So is this still a viable approach? If not, what are the limitations that you're gonna run into? What are the challenges that are gonna push you up against a solution like Kubernetes? Well, I think the short answer is is yes, it is still a viable solution. You have to make, when you're, when you're deciding which architecture you're going to run, you have to decide what is appropriate for your business needs, for your use case. Going out and deploying Kubernetes and containers and, and, and moving into that sort of more modern adoption of Drupal hosting is certainly very cool and extremely powerful if your use case demands it. However, there are still many, many cases, I think, where a VM a, 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 even a single VM running on a cloud provider or running in a data center is still viable if your use case doesn't really need all of the bells and whistles that you might get with Kubernetes. It, it is, there is no need to over-engineer the solution by necessarily having the latest and newest shiny thing. Yeah, I think that's, sorry. No, um, I think that's right. Um, definitely, there's a lot of stuff that Kubernetes gets you that is um, basically means in the end especially at scale, it's going to be less maintenance work for the hosting platform. Uh, I guess the flip side of that is that as a developer, you do sort of need to understand a little bit about how stuff is working under the hood because um, it is a bit different to the way traditional LAMP stacks are set up. So, yeah, you really do have to have a little bit of understanding. and There's a bit of a steep learning curve for sure. There's a lot, of, uh, there's a lot to, to learn about. But it's shiny. Well, <laughs> no, yeah, it, it, like you said, it, it just comes down to use case. It really does, like, if you don't have that strong need or, like, if you can see in your head, like, I'll provision this host, I'll provision this LAMP stack, I'm off. Like, that's, you know, that, like, that is still the way to go, um, for sure. But um, if your use case has changed, like, for us, like, we, we were in that position and then we realised, we're managing way too many of those, and we could combine them all into this like single um, uh, bucket of compute and make them all HA. Like that, that is when you know it turns from like getting stuff done to saying, okay, well, you know, we've got a strong use case to save a bit of money, make everything HA, and yeah, use case. Uh, I just, I just also wanted to add. I think there's a lot of when not talking about technology, but thinking about. Your, your mental health and your developer health, when, when you are constantly feeling this pressure, you go to a panel and you hear about people using Kubernetes and containers and all this new shiny stuff, it's very easy to be uh, on the other end of that and go, well, I'm, I'm not doing that stuff. Am I not keeping pace with my industry? Um, and I wouldn't think that, I don't think any of us would say, you should be using the newest and greatest thing even if you don't need it. Um, and you should be working on weekends to make sure that you can deliver it. It really is a case of it's, you've got to have the business requirement for it, but you've also got to make sure that your team can manage it um, and that it's not going to put too much stress on everybody. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, so what are your opinions on using managed services for things like databases, file systems, uh, edge caches, as opposed to rolling it yourself? Hey, that totally rips off exactly what you just said, you know? Like it, so for us, like managed services are key because we're a small team and, um, you know, I, it, it's really hard to debug HA MySQL, so. <laughs> um, and I don't want to spend my time doing that. I want to spend my time, you know, adding value to and, you know, improving our teams and the tools that they use and the workflows that they have. So for us, yeah, managed services are awesome. We yeah, we go whole hog with with managed services pretty much up and 
all the way up and down the stack and, and keep a pretty small team for it. But yeah, I, I strongly think it's exactly what you said. It's yeah, knowing what you can maintain and knowing where you want what, what you want to maintain. Yeah, I think um, it's definitely just there's a lot of uh, work that you can offload onto someone else then lets you sort of do the interesting value add stuff. Uh, the only caveat I guess would be just to make sure you understand exactly what the trade-offs are. I mean, if you, I mean it is easy to sort of rely on a lot of services that then you kind of get locked into like one particular cloud vendor or something like that or even just making sure that you know what's the availability zone that my managed database is running in or my managed cache or whatever. So just, I mean, and it's easy stuff, you just have to understand it. Um, I think as, as, as uh, hosting providers, we are for the first time ever in, in our history in a position where we can be hosting providers that don't run servers. Um, we can go out and we can get managed RDS, we can get uh, managed database, we can get managed Elasticsearch, we can get managed file systems, we can get managed VMs, where we're paying someone who is better, more capable, has a larger team, global operations to do that stuff for us. And it gives us the ability to focus on things like automating Drupal deployments and automating Drupal upgrades and all of the stuff that, that customers want from us. I never have a customer come up and say, can you please give me a server? Or can I please have more RAM? with obvious exceptions, but uh, that's, not, that's not what the customer wants to buy. The customer wants to buy a reliable Drupal website or a secure Laravel website or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think there's, for us being able to offload a lot of that responsibility is really, really powerful and I'm, I'm very, like everybody else, I'm very pro-managed services. Um, however, it's something that we often struggle with in terms of if we're paying someone else to provide their service on our behalf, we've got to make sure that they're going to deliver it against our expectations, which in most cases is true. And we need to make sure that when, our, when there's a fault and our customer comes to us and says, my Elasticsearch cluster isn't working or my database isn't performing properly, that the SLA that we've given our customer is an SLA that we've got with our provider. Um, and that's something else that we've got to watch out for. But buyer beware and all that, most of the time a managed service is going to save you a lot of effort that you can reinvest in something much more valuable to you, to your team. A uh, good segue will be into something like um, managed services for Kubernetes. So your EKSs, GKEs, DigitalOcean solution. What are your thoughts there? Everything I just said, we don't, we don't have a managed service for Kubernetes. We, we, we roll our own. Um, and we've gone through a cycle of uh, when we first started, I think the same as Skipper, previous next, you're, you're, you're provisioning your own VMs and putting Kubernetes on top of that. We started with that, then we moved into using uh, COPS, which is a sort of a turnkey cluster management solution for, um, for Kubernetes, principally on AWS. Recently, we've started looking at uh, Google Cloud's GKE platform as a fully managed service. Um, and there's, there's, there's good things and bad things about every approach. For us, um, it's easier for us and it suits us better to manage our own using COPS. Um, than it does to use something like a, a GKE, but it's, it's horses for courses. Yeah. No. Yeah, so we um, started off by yeah, rolling, rolling our own Kubernetes, like doing Kubernetes the hard way and um, really understanding what it took to run Kubernetes. And then it was a great day when we could offload that to, to EKS. Um, but we still understood what was going on under the hood as well and how that that runs and operates. I think there's there's something to be said there, but um, I, I guess the other thing about like all these like managed Kubernetes services is we've kind of crossed the point where um, like it's amazing that all these cloud providers have this like standard API essentially like between EKS, GKE, and EKS. Um, they all have you know Kubernetes and Docker registries and like they're all very standardized. But at the same time, by where we're getting to this point where all these Kubernetes services are now going to start adding their own value on top. So then you use them, like you can see that right now with EKS and then AKS is very aggressive with starting to add new features and improving it. So so I think, um, yeah. So there's a risk of vendor lock-in, is that what you mean? Yeah, a little bit of sneaky convenience 
vendor lock in. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, historically, uh, Maisie's uh, looked at, um, done their own Kubernetes clusters. We're shortly going to be um, doing some uh, looking at using managed uh, Kubernetes. Um, and it, yeah, like you guys have already said, it's just all about trade offs. Um, you get a little bit more control when you've got looking after your own stuff. And the trade off is you have to. Main, do the maintenance on it. <laughs> yep. Sorry to keep doing this. Uh, one other thing that just occurred to me, even if you are using, uh, I'll give you an example. We're on AWS, and up until very recently, if you were on AWS um, provisioning Kubernetes, you had a relatively inefficient network topology where the IP address for a container running in Kubernetes could be routed to any one of the nodes running Kubernetes. So if you had a load balancer at the front end of your, of, your, of your cluster, that load balancer would receive the request. It would send it to a node um, on a node's IP address, and that node would have potentially the container that you want, or it might not, and then nodes are going to route amongst themselves. So you might have this packet come into your load balancer and go all over the place before it ends up with your application. As your cluster scales and gets larger, that's obviously very, very inefficient. Amazon now have a network topology that you can deploy where every container or every pod running in Kubernetes gets a routable IP address that the load balancer or whatever external service can reach directly. Um, and that means that it's a lot more efficient. That was built for the managed EKS product on Amazon. Um, however, you don't have to have the managed EKS product on Amazon. So a lot of those benefits that, you would, that might attract you to that managed service can be brought into your self-managed cluster in other ways if you wanted to. So everyone's generally getting better, even if you're not using them. All right, um, let's get into the meat. So can you guys talk about um, ways that you've been deploying Drupal onto Kubernetes and the challenges of each approach that you've tried? Yeah. <clears throat> so for us, deploying Drupal under Kubernetes has definitely been a journey. Um, the first thing we really did was we consolidated and built a CLI API on top of Kubernetes. Um, I think uh, Kubernetes is a platform for platforms, and the interfaces and APIs that you work with are kind of like they're, they're kind of deemed like the machine code of um, of Kubernetes, like the YAML files. So. Yeah, so we built a, a workflow on top, and then uh, for two, three years, we honed it into into Skipper. So that's that's kind of our journey journey there with that workflow. Yeah. Um, in terms of interesting parts, I I think it's definitely been a journey keeping up with, especially with adopting Kubernetes like 1.1. We kind of went for a ride with um, new APIs coming out and new features j coming out just in time where we were like, I think we want that, and then it came out. But also um, bugs, so it's kind of like that early adopter thing where you just have to you know, ride the wave and, and work through it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Amazie's um, platform is obviously uh, Lagoon. Uh, that is the platform that's built on top of the Kubernetes platform. Uh, and basically, um, it just helps you, uh, when you spin up a Drupal site, provides a bunch of the auxiliary services that um, you know, aren't going to necessarily be there by default. You know, your solo, your database, those kinds of things. Um, yeah, and yeah. I think, as Nick was mentioning, Kubernetes has matured a lot. Um, especially over the last two or three years, and your ability, if you, if you aren't terribly familiar with Kubernetes, it can appear like just a way to orchestrate containers, but especially now, it is incredibly easy and powerful in terms of how much you can program Kubernetes. So you don't just say to Kubernetes, I want you to run my application. You tell it how you want it to deploy your application. You tell it, uh, I want to wait for this service to be ready before that service is ready. Uh, when we started deploying Drupal on Kubernetes, we did it in a very imperative way. We had our API, a customer would send an, in, uh, uh, an instruction to our API saying deploy this version on this environment, and we would send a message to an Amazon SQS queue, which would then trigger a Lambda function that would, the, uh, function that would then inject into a Kubernetes cluster the instruction to deploy that environment. But it wouldn't have any awareness of what that environment's current state is. 
Um, it was very much a, a, a sort of a set and forget. And if it worked, it worked. If it didn't, it didn't. And we might not necessarily know. Over time, as Kubernetes has evolved, we've managed to evolve into programming against the Kubernetes API directly um, using what's called a custom resource definition or using what's called operators, where we have a container that's our program that runs, and uh, you guys are doing the same thing, uh, runs our code inside the cluster that watches for a, a configuration change and then performs events that we, that we tell it to, like we would tell a human operator to follow a playbook or a manual. This uh, Go operator will, will run along and say, right, well, I've got a new environment. I need to configure SSL keys for that environment. So I'll do that first. And then once I know that my SSL keys are, are ready, then I'll fire up Nginx, and it'll do all of that sort of stuff. So it's really, it's incredibly powerful what you can do now in terms of managing a complex deployment pipeline that a human would have previously done that now a machine can do. Yeah, right. And for those mere mortals among us, like solutions like Helm, Rancher, OpenShift, like what are your thoughts on where people should get started? Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty tricky because there there are a lot of tools out there. Like there's a you know, there's lots of options. Um, in a lot of demos that I do, I T tend to lean towards um, Helm. So just because it's like a really, like it's, there's a big community behind it, there's a lot of documentation, it's a very mature product, and it's kind of an easy way to get started. It's, um, but I also don't think it's always the end goal because it's more of a package manager for running um, kind of like apt, or it's kind of akin to apt and yum, and um, which is okay, but we have different workflows for deploying Drupal. Um, in that, so update, updating a database. Right? That's where some of these tools don't really work very well. Um, they can update the application itself, but then you kind of want that extra workflow on top, and that's when you kind of deviate. But um, yeah, if, if you're getting started, I'd, I'd definitely say um, go, go look at home. Yeah, yeah I'd, uh, I'd second that. I think. As, as an example, if you needed to deploy a database and you don't really want to have to worry about how you deploy a database inside your cluster, you can go and get a Helm manifest for how to deploy MySQL that's really configurable and then away you go. And you can focus on something that's going to add more value to what you're doing. Yeah, the nice thing with Helm as well is that um, it's a good way to sort of, I mean, Helm, basically what it does is just template um, uh, objects that you're adding into Kubernetes. So it's a really good way to you know, deploy something like a database or whatever and then have a look at how it's kind of working, how things are plugged together. It's, it's a good way to uh, yeah, get your feet wet. Or come and use one of our tools. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think, yeah, like the question is really around, like learning, uh, around learning those APIs and what's the next step. Like I think that's, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, all right, so let's just get into some like details on key components of the stack specifically for Drupal. So. Uh, can you tell me what you guys are doing for uh, your shared file systems? So for us, uh, we're basically using uh, EFS from uh, Amazon. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what uh, the Gloom platform uses. Oh, have we had a fun time with file systems. <laughs> it is 100% like the topic in the Drupal Slack. Um, there's a lot of people talking about like S3 as a as a backing file system. So, yeah. Oh, have I got a story then? <laughs> um, but yeah, like uh, like looking at the Slack, like there are a lot of people that have maybe one site and then they'll go to S3 and they'll in do like a first class integration between Drupal and S3. But um, in terms of like mounted file systems, yeah, um, for a very long time there wasn't a great managed solution. You either had to roll your own, um, like HA mounted storage, so that's like you know, Gluster or Ceph or like these, yeah, these tools that are very, very, um, yeah, demanding to run. And um, for us, we did go down the Fuse S3 mounted route and uh, we evaluated, there was like three projects at the time, we picked one, it was, it was, uh, it, got us by, but it was definitely very tricky. And um, I remember that where I was, I joke about this, I remember exactly where I was on the day 
that I got the notification that EFS launched in Australia. <laughs> and then I think it was like a week later we had migrated everything across because it was just one of those, it was the single point of, yeah, of pain. So I might just, uh, if anyone's not familiar with EFS and, and with, with, with the problem, EFS is a managed network file system from AWS and it solves the problem of you've got a Drupal environment that's running in uh, with at least two web servers that might be in different availability zones or different regions, not different regions, different availability zones, um, and you want to make sure that both web servers see the same public files and private files system. Um, and you want to make sure that if somebody uploads something, they upload a PDF into the content system, that it's going to be available on the other web server right away. That is, an, from, a, from a, just a pure computing and infrastructure perspective, that is a really hard problem to solve. There are tools out there that you can deploy, like Gluster and Ceph, um, and we've certainly experimented with those in, in, in order to provide a file system that multiple systems can write to at once that doesn't break because of issues with consistency or trying to write to the same thing at the same time. EFS is the best solution we've got. Uh, I personally think it still, it still lacks quite a bit and I'm hopeful with, for the a AWS conference next week that they're gonna have some managed clustered file system that's gonna solve all our problems and we won't have to do it ourselves and manage services. Um, but that's the, that's the problem that EFS solves. And if you're running Drupal, uh, in Kubernetes with multiple, multiple web servers, then EFS is your best solution at the moment. If you're on Azure or Google Cloud, they have similar products that aren't quite as mature yet. For example, the Google Cloud product called Filestore uh, is a managed network file system, but it is zonal, it is not regional. So uh, you will have multiple availability zones with your cloud provider on Google Cloud that volume is only in one zone, which means generally it's only in one data center. If that data center goes offline, nothing else can bring that zone online, whereas something like EFS runs across up to three data centers, so if one data center goes offline, you're probably not even going to notice. So, yeah. All right, excellent. Uh, can you talk about like what your approach is to aggregating Drupal's logs and how you expose that to developers and your ops team? Uh, that's, that's a really tricky one. What we would love to be able to do is have a, a fast, easy to use web UI that customers can go to and they can pass all their logs, like something like a managed elastic search uh, or, or something to that effect. And for some customers we do do that, but elastic search is a very heavy and very expensive application to run, very hard to scale and maintain, um, good as a managed service. What we do at the moment is we use a utility called Fluent Bit which will collect logs from all of our different web servers and database servers and worker nodes and everything else. It aggregates them into a central repository and writes them to a, to a persistent disk um, that customers can then use to analyze and view those logs, to download them if they want to. Um, and that's been uh, a, a really, really useful process for us. Yeah, <clears throat> so we use um, CloudWatch logs, AWS CloudWatch logs. Um, we did go through the um, like running the Elk stack, like so the Elasticsearch, um, Kibana kind of stack, like, and um, ended up on CloudWatch logs just because it's easier for them to manage it. There's always regulation around like keeping logs for seven years in government, so it's very easy just to offload that and tell AWS to keep them for seven years. Um, but we definitely, and in terms of the integration, we ended up writing writing our own. Um, log pusher just because um, we wanted to get the groups and streams just right so it was a bit easier to use it was some of these tools are very um, like they cover a lot of cases so something like a fluent bit is kind of like it'll like grab all the logs but then you can kind of configure where it wants to go and it's very generic whereas we had a very specific format and structure that we wanted for our logs um, but I think the other side from that is um, if you've used CloudWatch logs before, it was very, very tricky to use up until recently. They've shipped a whole query UI that's super, super powerful. Santa actually writes some uh, queries that <laughs> amaze me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so if you have looked at CloudWatch logs in the past um, and gone uh, a bit basic, like def definitely come back and have a look. I, I really recommend it. Uh, yeah, so um, Lagoon also uses um, Elasticsearch basically as the log storage and I guess it's kind of the currently 
the best solution. Uh, everything Mike said, though, is true. It is extremely heavy and resource intensive. Um, there are a few other things out there that we're kind of having a look at and um, also just doing some experimentation because, uh, yeah, logging is kind of a little bit of a pain point and just being able to store those. Um, and, yeah, looking at uh, if you can get a managed service and, um, you know, sort of offload all that pain, uh, I think it's definitely a good idea. So I can I just ask a probing question to, to get in the guts of it? Like, how are you actually outputting Drupal's application logs? Because out of the box, Drupal puts it into the watchdog table. If you turn on the syslog module, it goes to varlog syslog. Yeah, what yeah. What are you guys doing? A good question. And, and the other caveat there is that if you're using syslog in a container, in order to do that effectively, you have to run FPM and syslog in the same container, which means you need something like Supervisor D, which is an anti-pattern for building containers. A container should only ever run a single service. Uh, the way that we work around that is that we get our customers to deploy monolog, which is really, really effective, and it can write Drupal logs to the file system. And then we read those logs into FluentBit and relay them off to the central store. It's an imperfect solution, though. Yeah. Um, we're in a very similar position, monolog, standard out. Um, we are looking at running like a syslog sidecar container and configuring monolog to push to that to kind of separate the, the PHP logs from the application ones. Also because um, there's, like I mentioned, like the keep your logs for seven years, there's different tiers for that, um, especially with government. Like your application logs are, are very, very, very important, whereas your web ones, I think it's three months, like your actual web requests, um, it's a lot lot smaller. So yeah, it just allows you to segregate it a bit. Also because Drush likes to um, take advantage of standard out as well. So, <laughs> so you end up clashing with a couple of other things as, at the same time. So. Uh, yeah. Very, very similar. Um, basically, just using um, out to standard log file and then FluentD out to um, to uh, Elasticsearch. Yeah, cool. Um, so, kind of coming close to time, so we'll just go on to some audience questions now. Um, so, Cy Hobbs, he tweeted, um, so with relation to vendor um, lock-in in relation to managed services, so like, for example, RDS, is that just a reality? Is that what we have to accept? Uh, I think it, it all depends on how much pain you want. Um, if you are able to use managed services and you're happy to stick with one vendor, then you will have a pretty pain-free life. Uh, we, To give you an example, um, we've not gone too far down the path towards using RDS. We, we have our own uh, database engine that can deploy replicated or standalone database environments that run on cluster. Um, that was very, very difficult for us to do. It took a lot of engineering in order to make it work uh, successfully. Um, I, th I think we've ended up with a really good product and what it means for us is that we can run the same database stack on AWS or Google Cloud. Um, and we want to be able to be uh, vendor agnostic as much as possible. Inside Kubernetes, most of what you deploy, if you deploy your application on, on one Kubernetes cluster, for most components, it's going to work the same on another Kubernetes cluster with another vendor. It's only when you integrate with something like volumes or load balances or external database services or other managed services that you might have some pain, um, but it really depends on what your appetite is. Lean into the lock-in. <laughs> Um, I think there's something to be said for the difference between something like a DynamoDB and an RDS. <clears throat> um, RDS has that consistent interface, MySQL. There's definitely benefits. So, like, a, we use Aurora Serverless. Um, so, you could, could say there's there's definitely lock in there because you look at it and go, well, it's MySQL and it auto scales for me and it's amazing. Why would I go elsewhere? But um, at the same time, you still you still have portability because you still have that MySQL interface and you still have that mounted file system. Like you still have those pieces. But yeah, moving is definitely there's there's a lot of conveniences that can keep you in place. But at the same time, they they also become your edge, so or they make thing, your life easier. So it's there's a trade off there. But I, I think we can all agree that making our lives a little bit easier is a good thing too. 
Yeah, I mean, we also use um, RDS quite heavily. Um, and I guess as, as far as locking goes, yeah, having the MySQL uh, as the interface makes it a lot easier to be a bit agnostic about your database provider. Um, there are other cloud services, though, that it's much easier to get locked into. So, um, yeah, it's also, I guess it's just about being um, aware of going in with your um, eyes open when you uh, decide to, like, really integrate closely with one particular provider. Yeah, cool. All right, so this is my uh, moment. I'm going to come down to the sidelines and get some audience questions. I feel like, um, does anyone remember Dipper? I used to go down the sidelines of the footy. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, what do you guys reckon about uh, using containerized databases? Is it okay in production? Is it okay anywhere? What do you think? I'm not a big fan of them in production um, because I think um, they're extremely stateful. So, yeah, it's like running a MySQL database on a cluster, like if you split that out, then you have so many more advantages. Like you can kind of, like your, it doesn't, like a database doesn't auto scale the same way as an application. It's not as elastic. So if you think of your cluster as like this very elastic piece in the puzzle and then separate your databases out um, into separate machines or managed services, then um, I think things get a lot easier from a management standpoint and from a availability standpoint. Um, but having said that, we do um, still use um, database containers for local development. So we um, snapshot, we sanitize and snapshot our dev staging production databases. And so that's everything like uh, user accounts and strip out the cache tables. And then that's all stored in a registry. And then developers can pull them down and use them as a part of their local stacks. Like that, that is where we use those. And I yeah, feel very strongly about that and that they work really, really well for local development. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned before that we, we do run our own containerized database platform. We, we do use it in production. That may be the contentious thing um, because every time I tell anyone who's, who's uh, an infrastructure engineer that we're using containerized databases in production, they're sort of like, oh, geez, you're, you're brave. Um, I think specifically for Drupal, if you're not using things like uh, dblog uh, and you've got good caching for your application and you've got a CDN, your database server requirements are going to be relatively small. Most of the sites that we host, the database is less than five gig. The traffic's relatively reasonable. There are some sites that are uh, you know, dozens of gigs for the database, very transactional, very heavy. Um, but even those sites we run in containers in production uh, quite successfully. But I did mention we had to do a tremendous amount of engineering to get a, uh, a, a replicated database platform that would run in multiple zones with automated failover and good security and everything else. It was a huge effort. Um, and if, if our use case was just a little bit different, I think we would just be using RDS um, because you pay a little bit more per month, but you save dozens of hours per month. Okay, I think we're like right about on time. So um, I'm sure that these guys would love to continue the conversation out in the hallway track if you're in the break. So, yep. um, but if you can all please give a round of applause.